Yo, yeah, what's up guys? Welcome to Digital Arts USMLE. Today we're going to cover some more microbiology, specifically Staphylococcus epidermidis. Its characteristics, virulence factors, the organ systems affected by it, and the treatment options based on the type of infection. And while we're at it, as usual, we can go over some of the mechanisms of action that the antibiotics have. So what is Staphylococcus epidermidis? It is a gram-positive staphylococci and a facultative anaerobe, similar to Staphylococcus aureus. So under the microscope, after staining the organism, it will look purple with a bunch of cocci everywhere, which are pretty much like these great blank clusters. It's also catalase positive. So just remember that this test differentiates staph from strep, and it just turns that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So the next step is to differentiate staph epidermidis and staph saprophyticus, which I'll get into a little bit detail later from Staphylococcus aureus. And the way we do that is the coagulase test. So in this case, both Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staph saprophyticus are coagulase negative, aka cons. So that makes our life pretty easy. So now we just need to differentiate Staph epidermidis from Staph saprophyticus. And the way we can do that is the novobiosin test. So novobiosin is just a weak antibiotic. We usually take a urine sample and the reason why it's a urine sample is because we want to differentiate the saprophyticus, which usually women get from UTIs, from Staph saprophyticus. And we take place that urine sample onto a culture, and specifically this culture has a novobiosin disc placed on top of it, and then we check the growth around it afterwards. So after 24 hours of incubation, you check the zone around it where you place the novobiosin disc. So in this case, it's a white circle you see in the middle of the screen. And you check the zone around it. And there's a specific criteria that it has to meet in order to be resistant or sensitive. So if it's less than 12 millimeters, it's resistant. If it's 16 millimeters or more, then it's sensitive. So basically, Staph epidermidis will be novobiosin sensitive. And this test is 100% sensitive and 96% specific. So yeah, it's like pretty damn good. So just a little bit more about Staph epidermidis and where it lives. It's all around our skin, our nose, and vagina, if you have a vagina. So the main thing we have to worry about is subacute endocarditis because it has such a high mortality rate of 30% within the first year. So yeah, it can get like pretty bad. And this will damage the heart valves. It is usually from catheter infections. So like, Think of IV drug users or diabetics injecting insulin or injecting drugs inside their body and they're pretty susceptible to this because of course we're shoving all that bacteria which is part of our normal flora on our skin into our bloodstream. So the difference between acute endocarditis which was previously in Staph aureus versus subacute which is in Staph epidermidis is that subacute infections can only happen with a damaged heart valve or prosthetic valves. And it uses its virulence factor fibronectin to do this. This just allows it to attach on to the damaged heart valve. So on presentation, they will most likely have a murmur and a fever going on. And that is, those are really the two big criteria, like a fever and a murmur. And along with this, they might have some systemic weakness and probably some weight loss. Just make sure to check their hands, feet, and eyes as well during your physical exam. You might see ulcer nodes, which are like small nodules, and they're pretty painful to touch. And they can usually be on the fingers or toes. They also have Janeway lesions, which are these non-tender dark spots that are usually around the palms of the hands. And also check their retina for rot spots. So these rot spots, they're just these areas of retinal hemorrhage, and they usually look pretty pale around like the center area. So just remember R for retina and R for rot spots and you'll see it during your fundoscopic exam once you do it on the patient. And you definitely want to check their nail beds for any splinter hemorrhages. And just remember, all these basically come from the microembolization of the vegetations that are being produced around the heart valve. So they're gonna like chip off and then they'll just go somewhere randomly and they can cause damage. And it doesn't just have to be in the hands, it can be even like the joints or even in other parts of the body and it can just cause ischemia and pain. So 
that's one of the main things I wanted to really hone down on was the joints because uh, that's a pretty big thing they usually test on besides a fever and a murmur. So if they have joint pain, you definitely want to think about ischemia from a broken off vegetation. And I actually knew someone in their late 20s who presented in the hospital with a minor fever and just hip pain. That's all they had. They didn't have anything else. And after a full workup, they found out that he ended up having vegetations in his heart from his bicuspid aortic valve, which ended up breaking off and causing not only his joint pain, but also a stroke as well later on. So yeah, it can mess you up pretty bad. And one of the big complications is chordae tendine rupture. If that happens, then you're pretty much screwed at that point because your tendine is ruptured from the papillary muscle. And yeah, blood's just gonna be going back and forth because your valves aren't working properly. So afterwards, you definitely want to go and get your blood cultures and sensitivities along with your other lab tests. You'll probably see the organism growing. You definitely want to do an echocardiogram to check for vegetations in the heart. So once you do all that, you want to treat them with a combination of vancomycin with rifampin or aminoglycosides initially while you're waiting back for sensitivities. So rifampin just inhibits the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, specifically the bacterial RNA polymerase. And it can also turn your body fluids orange, but they usually don't test you on that. They'll usually test you on how it causes liver damage and how you have to check their LFTs and liver function tests. So you want to check like their AST, ALT to see if they have any liver damage. That's like the one of the big things they usually test you on. For the aminoglycosides, they're used to cover the gram-negative organisms. So we have vancomycin, which will cover our gram-positive organisms by inhibiting the diala diala and preventing cell wall synthesis, while the aminoglycosides will cover the gram-negatives, and they basically work by inhibiting protein synthesis. So they pretty much just screw up the elongation process at the 30S ribosomal subunit. So the mRNA translation is read wrong, and once the mRNA translation is read wrong, then the proteins are going to come out all like messed up. And yeah, it's only going to affect the 30S, because just remember, prokaryotes have 30S and 50S, and eukaryotes, us, we have 40 and 60 S. So besides antibiotics, there are some other treatment options such as surgery, and there are indications for them. And a few of the indications are uncontrolled CHF symptoms, so uncontrolled congestive heart failure symptoms, periannular extension. So this just means that the annulus, which is just like the glue portion around the top of the valves, which allows the valve to stick onto the endothelial portion of the heart, gets damaged and the damage is spreading pretty fast because the bacteria is growing around there and if that area gets damaged too much then of course the glue is not going to hold and the valve is going to sort of pop off so that's one indication to do surgery um, another reason is if they have vegetations and there's two pretty strict criteria one is if they have vegetations greater than 15 millimeters then you just do surgery right away and they don't even have to have like any sort of embolic event happen. You just want to do it right away before anything happens. But if they have a vegetation that's 10 millimeters or more, and they have one embolic event, then you can also do surgery. And by embolic event, I mean like ischemia or stroke or something along that line. And if they have neurologic complications, that's of course another reason to do surgery. And the most high yield would be fungal infections. They usually test on that. It's like a step two thing. So usually after surgery, they will do a culture of the infected valve, and after the cultures and sensitivities have returned, then you can choose a specific antibiotic to cover that organism. So another problem they can cause is biofilms, aka slime. And these biofilms are pretty much formed by something called quorum sensing. So it's when the bacteria pretty much just get together, and they release these chemicals which tell each other, okay guys, it's time to make some slime. So these bacteria do clump up to make this slime layer. Eventually they make slime that just sort of protects it from our bodies and any antibiotics as well. And this is a pretty big problem for IV drug users or diabetics or anyone in the hospital with a peripheral line or central line that just stayed in for way too long. And if you look at where their line is at, you might see some redness and warmth around the area. If the infection's real bad, then they might have some septic symptoms and they might even have like a fever as well. So besides antibiotics, the very first thing that even a medical student can do is remove the line. And this can help out quite a lot. So yeah, this is pretty much Staphylococcus epidermidis in a nutshell. 
If you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see or any better ways of presenting, please let me know. And just remember to like and subscribe. And thanks for watching, guys. Lada.